Welcome to the EpicureanFriends.com book review of A Few Days in Athens, a story about Epicurus and Epicurean philosophy. Please keep in mind that A Few Days in Athens is fictional, and the author is giving you her own interpretation of Epicurus. In a few cases, she deviates from Epicurus's own views fairly dramatically, but when we get to those, we'll point them out to you clearly. Even more, keep in mind that the participants you're about to hear are giving their own opinions. There are many different interpretations of Epicurus, and we hope this book review will prompt you to study Epicurus for yourself. For those who want to read more about Epicurus, the book we recommend the most is Norman DeWitt's Epicurus and His Philosophy. We also invite you to join us for discussion at the EpicureanFriends.com forum and to listen to our companion podcast, Lucretius Today, which is available at all major podcast sources. Thank you for listening, and we hope you'll enjoy this session. So let's join it now. Welcome to the session. This is the ninth session, I think, of the A Few Days in Athens book review. This one's on chapter eight. Last week was the big confrontation between Zeno and Epicurus at the porch, and they dispersed after that. And this chapter starts with Theon finds himself in the house or the garden of Epicurus, and finds his way into a room where Metrodorus and Epicurus are basically studying or at work with their books. And there's a conversation between Epicurus and Theon, in which Theon reports that he has spent more time with Cleanthes and these have argued about the events of what's happened. And there's a discussion between the two of them that I end up citing uh, in many cases for the proposition that Francis Wright makes that arguments rarely change people's minds, that generally the, an explanation either brings people closer together or further apart, but it rarely ends in, in basically a stalemate. And then they discuss the history of Cleanthes a little bit, which is sort of interesting, a boxer by trade before he became a philosopher. And then there, the discussion moves over to the questions of candor and the way you present yourself to other people, which is basically, I think, the major topic of probably the latter half of the book with a discussion between all of them about the fact that Epicurus may present himself as with great deal of mildness and candor and good humor, but that he still has enemies. And the issue is discussed about how you should really treat this fact. And Metrodorus suggests to Epicurus that Epicurus should be more aggressive towards his enemies and more firm. And Epicurus ends up arguing against that course and says he has no wish for to fear him. It's interesting that Metrodorus does not seem to back down, though, from his position. The chapter, I believe, ends with Metrodorus still alleging that Epicurus would be better off if he would be more aggressive with his enemies and being his case to others. So those are the major events, to the extent that there's events at all in this chapter. And I'm going to have to refer back to the actual text in order more detail out of it. But at this point, Joshua, did particular parts of it strike you as more important than others that would make sense for us to talk about first? Well, that's that's the difficulty, as you say, because it, it is rather all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing of real great substance here other than, as you indicate, the conversation on candor, which is quite important. Um, so we talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, the back and forth between Epicurus and Theon at the beginning, there, there's a lot of repartee between the two of them where they go back and forth with some sort of witty dialogue in which Epicurus is not exactly playing with Theon, but pointing out to him that Theon is stubborn and obstinate. And uh, then they go back and forth about how Epicurus wouldn't have told them that if, if he didn't think he would basically profit from the information, I guess is what's said there. So I'm looking for an entry point there, Joshua, to exactly where it opens up, because they talk about stubbornness for quite a while, which probably does sort of set the stage for this latter discussion about candor and the way you present yourself. Now, it's here in this chapter that Metrodorus makes the point that Timocrates is his brother. Mm -hmm. I think we discussed previously that that may be in here somewhere. I don't know whether that is that can be substantiated in the ancient texts or not. Joshua, yeah. do you have, remember that? Yes. Uh, Timocrates of uh, Lampsicus. Yeah, it, it's in there. I, is it in Diogenes Laertius, do you think, or somewhere else? That I don't know if it's in that or if it was, uh, or if there's a different source for it. But Okay. Um, okay. I will say one point of minor interest to me, since I've got 
basically two feet in the grave already with my age. And I still can't really talk <laughs> myself out of a paper bag. But there's an interesting part in here where Epicurus is making the point that Cleanthes would be just making the general point that being able to speak in public is something that can sort of just happen to you or that you struggle. And then all of a sudden you do it once. And then I guess it's kind of like maybe riding a bicycle. Once you've done it once <laughs> and you understand how to do it, it becomes a whole lot easier to and that Cleanthes' name was the ass or something like that. I think I've read that somewhere well, else. I'm not sure what that reference to. But uh, the, the whole discussion of Cleanthes doesn't seem to me to add an awful lot to much of it. So I guess the whole issue of Timocrates being Metrodorus's brother sort of introduces them to the issue of Metrodorus taking the position that Epicurus should be more aggressive in with his enemies. Right. And, and that's probably something that has some relationship to the, not the surviving texts necessarily, but... In Diogenes Laertius, you have a list of texts written by uh, each of the sort of the main three. And among the texts attributed to Metrodorus are uh, def rather defensive texts written to defend Epicurus against some of the things that were said in particular about his birth and about his parents. And so that, that his own brother would you know, turn out to be so problematic, I think. It maybe relates to that in some sense, but and then in some sense, there's you know he he wants to uh, he wants to speak out in defense of uh, his his teacher, and the th because the things he's, he's what saying that he wants to he, speak out in defense of his teacher, I think is what yeah, yeah okay yeah. okay okay that's what I said yeah because you had Neocles who is Epicurus's father was a I guess an itinerant teacher he would he would go around and almost like a tutor. Um, and mm -hmm. this was this was considered at the time to be sort of an occupation of low repute. It wasn't something that was going to bring you fame. We have this idea in the in the modern age that um, education is so important, which I think it is, and that teachers are therefore you know the how we mold our next generation. But that that was not the view of uh, teachers in the time that this that this was written. We still do have some of that around, though. I would just just minor point, but you know, there's kind of the yeah. expression that <laughs> that um, teachers are people who can't do. You know, so yes, they teach. yes, that's <laughs> right, right, right. You probably heard that. And then those who, those who can do, those do, who can't those who can't teach, teach. That's it. <laughs> and then those who can't teach, teach something. You know, they'll say teach education, yeah. whatever. Yeah, PE. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Probably something like that in ancient Greece, maybe. Yes. Right. Right. And, and uh, of course, the ideal for a, for a philosopher is to be a philosopher. We were talking about that this morning. And Pla Plato's view that the philosophers were the best of men. And uh, so to to take something as noble and in, and ennobling as a philosophical pursuit of truth and to, to debase it, which I think was probably the view um, as a mere pursuit of, you know, sort of baser low level knowledge about historical facts, uh, stuff like that. It's, you can see, I think, why the, why the divide maybe happens. And then of course, Epicurus's mother uh, it was rumored that she was some kind of, I, I don't know if witch is the right word, but she had some role in uh, likewise going from village to village. And apparently Epicurus, when he was a boy, would go with her and she would, you know, read palms or, uh, you know, read auger, whatever the whatever the done thing was at the time. She was she was kind of uh, I'm trying to come up with a better name than charlatan. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. She she was a gypsy. Yes, yeah, it yeah, sounds like go. that, yep. doesn't it? Yeah. Yep. That's probably better. But but, um, but I mean, OK, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. But anyway, the only thing I wanted to say about that is is because people were saying things about Epicurus' parents, Metrodorus wrote books um, specifically in defense of Epicurus, for one thing, and saying that many of these rumors probably weren't true. But then he, he also wrote books saying that, by the way, none of his books survived. So these are just these are just inferences that are being made about them. But he also wrote books to indicate that low parentage was was not necessarily indicative of a person's ability to lead their own school. Joshua, if you're at a, a stopping point for the moment, I would move us down probably to the first longer paragraph here that I really think bears some deep consideration would be the the one where Picker says, if it be so, these useful qualities have not been attained without much study and discipline. So Theon has told him that 
well, you have more forbearance and candor than any man I've ever heard of. And Epicurus launches into an explanation of that that I think is kind of interesting. He says that, and, and this goes back a little bit in my mind to the discussion with Zeno, because he says that his temperament is not, he says Zeno is mistaken in thinking that his virtue is the child of his temperament and that it's just because he's the type person who can be mild and gentle and still firm that he got to be where he is because he says that he very early on saw that candor was indispensable, but that he had to, he naturally had a mild temper and a sensitive heart. They felt kindly towards his fellow men. But the next one was more difficult, he says, to be slow in pronouncing what is a fault and what is a folly. And that really takes me back to the confrontation with, it sounds like Francis Wright was saying that the heart of Stoicism is really this issue of condemning evil and pronouncing what's a fault and what's a sin, that Epicurus is much more slow to reach those kind of conclusions. And he gives some examples of prejudice and so forth that he uses examples. But he says, the a thousand lectures had I read myself ere I could calmly say upon all occasions that it does not follow that a thing is because I think it is. And until I could say this, I never presumed to call myself a philosopher. So it's almost it's almost kind of interesting that he's, you'd almost see this as backing off from some kind of a dogmatism. But I think he sees it as compatible, at least Francis Wright is saying it's compatible for him to say that he thinks some things are true with confidence. And on the other hand, he's still going to be slow to condemn what he sees as something as evil. So he had schooled himself into candor and found that he was possessed of forbearance. Uh, let me ask here now. So I found this whole business about candor very interesting. In what little, and it's not a lot that I've read in uh, the ancient texts and so forth about Epicureanism, have I heard about candor very much? Okay, is, this is a new new thing. Is, is there a lot of stuff about this? Is this a characteristic of either Epicurus or his philosophy? Or is this something that's kind of popping up new from Francis Wright? Just, okay. uh, just a simple, I don't mean to go into this too heavy, but I'm just No, no, curious. this is a great question because, yeah, Josh will help me on what the references would be, but absolutely, yes. I know that, that DeWitt really stresses this in his summary of Epicurean philosophy, and I'm sure he uses numbers of references, but let me see which, what comes to mind as a good example, Joshua. Well, I, I might be mistaken here, and I wish I had uh, Don by my side, but I think mm -hmm. that the Greek word is parisia. Parisia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, which I, I guess is often translated to something like freedom of speech, but what it, what it really means is the tendency, I, I think, to speak freely. Or frank speeches they use, they describe frank it, right? Speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But I'm kind of like you. I would struggle to come up with a really good citation for that. Yeah. And, and, and also, Scott, as you might anticipate, because of this emphasis on candor, that's why I, I consistently sort of hit back a little bit at the God situation, because there is a lot of stress in Epicurus on being truthful. And so, again, if you're not going to be truthful on something important, that would be very inconsistent. But mm -hmm. Joshua, there's got to be examples we can call to mind, though, but I'm not able to quickly. It seems to me there must have been something in the, in the Torquatus material. Did mm -hmm. we talk about that? Well, you know, there's there's the, the whole thing about you have to be honorable, just, and, and wise in order to live happily. But the word honorable is always kind of ambiguous, doesn't really fit exactly. Um, right. I mean, I know that there's a whole, I believe there's a whole book on Phil, from Philodemus on frank speech, right, um, Joshua? Yeah, yeah, you're right. So, so it may be that this comes from Philodemus as much as is in the original text. But Scott, I, even though I'm going to fall short of giving you a good example right now, I know <laughs> that it is considered to be something that is very basic to Epicurean well, yeah. philosophy. One of, one of my favorite lines of Lucretius, particularly as translated by uh, Ralph Humphreys, goes something to the effect of, if you waver or stray just a little, uh, he said that my honey tongue from my rich heart will pour such inexhaustible potions from its stores that slow old age, I fear, will creep in before I have exhausted your attention over one item only. And so you do see quite a lot of that in, in Lucretius, where it's, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna, not only going to tell you that there are nothing but atoms in void, but I'm also going to give you 19 examples of how we think we know that. I think I know how the magnet works, but I'm going to give you five different theories about how the magnet works. And so there's, there is the idea in, in Lucretius in particular about 
as, as he says, I think a number of times, sort of burning the candle at both ends, staying up late at night to put together this magnificent poem running to about, I think, 7,000 lines to explain Epicurean philosophy to a man who apparently I, I don't think uh, really wanted to hear it or had much time for it. It's certainly implied in all of this emphasis that they put on giving you the evidence and, and showing you how to reason your way through to your own conclusion. It's implied that you're not taking anything on authority. You're always looking for the evidence and, and concluding it yourself. But Scott, one more thing that I can say with specificity that you might be interested in is that there is a there there is a um, some text remaining that Plutarch has preserved, and I forget Joshua whether it's by Metrodorus or by somebody else, but it's the there's a there's an essay out there called the Epicurean Criticism of Socrates, and there's a well developed argument critical of Socrates on the grounds that not necessarily that he was wrong, but that he would not be truthful with his students, that he was always playing games. The disingenuous. Socratic, yeah, disingenuous. Yeah. That this, sure. I, I, I don't know who's an honest man or you can't always, I, don't, I know nothing. That's what it is. I know nothing. Right, is what right. always say. And I know that that is specifically recorded in Plutarch. And if you were to go to Google right now and put in Epicurean Criticism of Socrates, there's a long academic article that cites a lot of that text. And it's very specific on exactly this point, that the Epicureans were critical of the supposedly the greatest philosopher who ever lived on the argument that he was not honest and open, displaying candor with the student. So that would be one place, right, that mm -hmm. it could be documented for sure. It's interesting. It's an interesting point. And whether, you know, you've done a great job, really, I think, gathering together um, some some good evidence for this. And certainly, you know, you, you feel this from Epicurus, even, you know, this is just a feeling kind of thing, you know, but that he wasn't somebody who was deceiving, you know, a deceitful kind of person, you know, he was just hard on the sleeve right out here. Here's who I am kind of guy is what I feel from his philosophy and stuff. Scott, Scott did you have you read Lucretius at all? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I haven't read the whole thing, but yeah, okay. I've read well, that is, that's one thing that everybody says about Lucretius is what comes through is, is just how sincere it seems to yeah. be and how intense it is that he's trying to, to convince people of the correctness of his position for their sake as much as for any other reason. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Did I cut you off? Were you about to say something? No, else? That, that's 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 basically it. I just simply had. I guess I guess the idea of candor is just a slightly different thing from speaking honestly or something. There's there's just a sort of a, a social element to candor where you really say, "Hey, um, Scott, I, I I really think you're a dork, even though some ideas you've got are okay." That's being candid, you know, that sort of thing, which is it's it's a social aspect to it. And but it, but it was interesting. And and as I read through this particular chapter, I bumped into that word for six times. I'm like, hmm, mm. this is really so they're getting into the personality. But I did, I did, I, as I started with this, I don't, I don't want to make too much of this. <laughs> it's not a really a big deal, but I, I thought it was kind of interesting. Well, it's certainly a pretty significant one, and especially when you compare it to Plato, when you come up with these noble lies that Plato is famous for. Uh, that's why I, re I resist any equivalence between Platonic noble lying and Epicurus's views on the gods or anything else, because I, I do think he's very specifically taking the position that you should not be lying with to people. Let's see, where do we go? Uh, well, there's a quote, not, it's completely unrelated to Epicurean philosophy, but not completely unrelated to what we're talking about. And I think that it comes from uh, the late Bertrand Russell, who said something to the effect of the great problem with the modern world is that uh, fools, I don't know if that's his word for it, but something to that effect is that the ignorant are so sure of themselves, but but wise men are so full of doubt. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I've heard oh something God, like yeah. That. yeah. Yeah. And that seems to be a problem. I, I'm obviously not going to call myself a wise person, but I, I do struggle with with candid speech. It's not something that comes naturally to me. Well, a lot of this reminds me too of what Scott has brought up in the past in several instances about how perhaps it is going to be necessary for Epicureans to be a little bit more forceful in maintaining their positions at times if they're going to survive or have a, a, a continuity of a school. But that doesn't really seem to be the point that Epicurus is arguing here or that Francis Wright is arguing here. He's not admitting that he's going to be less effective because he is using candor. You know, I guess that there is could distinguish that the religious point of view of whether it's true or not. I know that people allege 
language that Christians that in the Abrahamic traditions that what do you call it Kia or there's some word for lot noble lying or whatever that uh, oh that, yeah. Uh, yeah I associate that word with uh, Islam in particular is yes I, is that I, I probably got the word totally wrong but uh, no it, it, I don't think you're too far off I think it's T A Q I Y Y A or something like that the underlying idea is that lying is wrong but lying in defense of the faith acceptable and, yes, so, and therefore exactly. lying to and therefore lying to the infidel is acceptable exactly that's exactly what i've run into now would we say that epicurus would disagree with that or would he agree well he'd probably disagree with the word infidel in this context but <laughs> that's all right, that's all right. <laughs> but i, the, I, I ahead, do Josh. think there it, there is a sense in which epicurus would expect you to tell the truth here here's a perfect example and i cited this in the podcast recording earlier today and i think it was principal doctrine i can't remember the number it wasn't 22 that was a different one. but but what he says is no actually it was a vatican saying i got that wrong what he says is he says is to be frank as i study nature i would rather speak in oracles that which mm-hmm. is of benefit to all men mm-hmm. even if it be understood by none rather than to uh, speak in such a way as to uh, gain the praise of the multitude. So there would be an example. We'd have to get the exact quote. And of course, I don't have my computer handy, but. Right, right. That is, that's pretty close to the, to the text, if I recall. Now, being a lawyer, what I'm always concerned about the hard cases, like what about lying to a burglar or the person who's got a, who the person who's breaking down your door and asks you where your gun is so that you can kill them? Are you going to be honest and tell them where your gun is or you're going to lie to them? I don't think Epicurus would have any problem with saying that he would lie in a situation. I actually think it would be a Stoic who might say that, uh, that, that virtue is, is inviolable and I will never lie under any circumstances. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yep. It's like that story about George Washington. <laughs> I, cannot <tell> a lie. <laughs> I cannot tell a lie. Gosh, that yeah. dates you, Joshua. I'm not sure many people talk about George Washington cutting down that cherry tree anymore. But... <laughs> oh, it's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> well, I should clarify that that was not in living memory for me. But... <laughs> that's, right, that's, right. <laughs> that's right. Okay. So at some point, uh, Metrodorus says to, is it Metrodorus? Yes. Metrodorus says to Epicurus that that's his only fault, that you're too mild and too candid. Uh, and so Epicurus and Metrodorus go back and forth on this particular point. And Epicurus accuses Metrodorus of being too basically hot blooded, I guess is what he's saying. But Metrodorus doesn't back down. And if you would but turn more fiercely upon your enemies or let me do so for you, they'd respect you more, for they would fear you more. And Epicurus says that he's not a god or king or a soldier. I have no claim to fear. And for, as a philosopher, I have no wish for, it. which maybe that helps us navigate those, those intricacies there. Because I guess if he was saying if he were a king or a soldier, then he might need to, he might have a need for having a, but as a philosopher, he had a wish for that. Right. This is one of the issues among what they call the new atheism, that this is one of the faults they point out in particularly Abrahamic religion, where uh, you're asked to love a God that you also fear. That mm. This is an inherently unstable and unhealthy <laughs> relationship, mm-hmm. if if at all possible. You know, it, it might not even be possible to love something that you fear. Well, you've heard of the strict father paradigm, I suppose, right? Well, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And I guess that's kind of the the mo here that that yeah. that father figure is is somebody that you fear and yet you love him. But I agree with you. I mean, there's an obvious tension there. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, yeah. there's a and I don't mean to move us on to the very end because we can spend as much time on any parts of this anybody wants to, but in getting ready for this and this, this episode at the very end, I, I did not really remember this, this way until I came across it at the end of the day today. Do I, do I'm ga- do I gather that Epicurus actually pushes Metrodorus away from him that if, if you guys can look at it's these last two paragraphs basically where it starts out don't name the wretch where Metrodorus mm-hmm. is talking about uh, Timocrates Timocrates uh, insulted Hedea who was allegedly Epicurus's adopted child and the indignant disciples thrust him from the gardens and he goes to our enemies and feeds their malice with infernal lies and so First of all, that was of, of note to me is, I, I don't know whether there's any basis for this 
episode between Timocrates and Hedaya. Or, uh, but then, then after that, the next paragraph says, how darest thou, said Epicurus, thrusting his scholar indignantly from him. Thy anger is unworthy of a man, how much more than of a brother. Go and recollect thyself, my son. And so he, I don't know if he pushed him away, but thrusting his scholar in is something else, but it sounds like Epicurus is reacting with some degree of firmness candor. against Metrodorus for this. <laughs> candor. Candor. Well, well, candor is a word generally, I guess. It's almost when I read the word thrust, I almost candor. hear the word pushing. Yeah. Physical candor. Yes. Diplomacy by other so, means. And what is he mad at Metrodorus for? He's mad at Metrodorus for being, for being angry mad. with Timocrates. Yeah, from not mm-hmm. being nice. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if, if it has the something anger to do is... with that line, curses of the Furies on the wretch. So in spite of everything mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. Epicurus uh, says and teaches and believes about the nature of the gods, to then to then turn around and ask the gods to curse not only not only a, another person, but your brother. Um, might you know, that, that could be, to... Joshua. Yeah, uh, that because that paragraph before because... that is Met- Metrodorus speaking. Yes. Rather yeah, a long I, sentence too. Maybe that's <laughs> yes, it is. But but maybe that's program. exactly what it is. What Joshua said. Maybe maybe most of the sentence was okay. But then when he gets to the end and says "curses of the Furies on the wretch," maybe that is intended that he went over the line at that point. How does he go over the line? I don't follow you guys. What, what's what's why is that so offensive to Epicurus? Well, Epicurus does say that because he's charged with uh, impiety. Incidentally, the same charge that was. Uh, levied against Socrates. Mm-hmm. And his response to that is, it is not those who are impious who uh, doubt the gods' existence, but those are impious who attribute to the gods behavior that is foreign to their divine nature. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. in, invoking a curse of the gods on on a you know another person would be an example, uh, not merely of just being rude to another person, but actual impiety impiety yeah i agree with that joshua yeah but you know part also of the discussion between them leading up to that was that you know metrodorus is trying to say that he knows better than epicurus about how to deal with other people and and epicurus is trying to tell metrodorus that you should be slow to anger against other people you should not find fault with them because you should realize within yourself how easy it is for you to make a mistake. And instead of learning that lesson, I guess what Metrodorus is doing here is he's turning around. And when he talks about Timocrates, he's totally ignoring what Epicurus has just told him to do in terms of being mild with someone who is is basically offending you. He is instead condemning him indignantly and so Metrodorus is just giving Epicurus an example that he's just not going to listen to him on that instruction. Well, right. that, may, that, that sounds right, but it sure also sounds like Epicurus just turns right around, does the same thing right back at him. Right. Yeah. That's a good point, Scott. Is he contradicting himself by firmly yeah. uh, scolding Metrodorus? Yeah, he actually didn't do it for that firmly. That's Francis Wright inserting that in there. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, you can write it off. Next paragraph. <laughs> there's no telling how much of this the actual plot here is is just fiction. Like I said, I think we do know that Timocrates uh, was the, the the brother of Metrodorus, and mm-hmm. I think it's also known that he left the Epicurean school and went over to Stoicism. But I, beyond that, I I don't know how much stock to put in any of it. Well, for the hundredth time, I'll say that I continue to be amazed at the depth of of somebody here, Francis Wright, presumably, in coming up with all this because she's finding a way to just to work into a story so many different aspects of Epicurean philosophy and distinguishing it from Stoicism by giving illustrations. And this is this is probably an illustration to some extent of what has just been discussed in that last chapter. Epicurus is telling Metrodorus not to be so harsh on Timocrates. Epicurus himself has told the assembly at the porch that Timocrates was a liar, but that doesn't mean he's gone any further and cursed him to the gods or anything like that. So it's very it, well it's, it's structured really, here. But it's also it's also contradictory here. I see Francis Wright has really been on target and consistent throughout her writing. This mm-hmm. second to last paragraph here, or this last full paragraph, seems inconsistent. First of all, um, Epicurus personality and characteristic, which has been so carefully developed to be so um, able to 
deal with confrontation without getting angry himself. And secondly, that it, actually, when you look at what he says, fee, how darest thou, is he really PO'd about the curses of the furies on the wretch because of, you know, cursing the gods or whatever, when he really says the very next thing is, thy anger is unworthy of a man, how much then of a brother? He doesn't really seem like the gods are the part that's wrong with what he's doing. It's your anger is wrong. And that's, that's mm -hmm. just totally mm -hmm. out of character for this persona that Francis Wright has developed, which is absolutely this wonderfully charismatic, sweet, kind person, strong, but nonetheless, this sweet, kind person. And he would never, you know, shove somebody away and tell them, how the hell dare you? Because when you say, how dare you, that language means, um, wow, you just really crossed a different boundary. You haven't just been bad here. You've been horrible, evil. This is just, I don't know, something special when you say, how dare you? I think you're absolutely yeah. right, Scott. And the idea of grabbing someone by the shoulders and shaking them and screaming them into their face to not be angry is <laughs> it's, it's a hard image. Of course, to, of course right? it doesn't say that quite. Well, that not exactly. He really but... punched him, though. <laughs> <laughs> if she had just left out that first sentence there, the fight, how darest thou, and, and then the rest of that about thrusting him, if she had just gone on and, and yeah. quoted him as saying, thy anger is unworthy, it would have probably been more consistent. You're probably right yes. about that. So that was funny. And she doesn't seem like the kind of person that would accidentally make an inconsistency. But you know, but, but you know Scott, uh, I, I keep addressing these things to you because you've raised th this issue that's so dear to my heart as well about how strong an Epicurean might need to be sometimes. We're going to see as the book goes forward several episodes, including th this episode where, where Epicurus rescues Hedia from getting drowned in a stream. It's kind of a strange thing to even say without reading the chapter. But I do think that, that you do see several flash is in this book here of her portraying Epicurus as not just a passive wallflower type person, that he does have flashes of active activity or action uh, in, in doing certain things. So we need to be prepared for the fact that, in fact, there is a, Ellie likes to quote this, and Joshua, I don't know if you can help me think about it or not, but there is a recorded text about how Epicurus said that, uh, Oh my gosh. And and she she basically reproduces in this chapter that I'm talking about, but it's it's something about not acting until the time is ripe, but then when the time is ripe, you must should act with all your vigor or something like that. Do you remember that, Joshua? That you know what I'm talking about? You may not have yeah, heard that from Ellie. That's not immediately coming to mind. Ellie, Ellie likes that one and has even done a graphic about it at some time in the past. I'll find that. But there are different texts that do document Epicurus is not just taking a flat across the board, apathetic position about how to deal with problems. He is willing to take physical action when appropriate, which I think is just an obvious application of the philosophy, but you don't see too much of it in the text discussing things like that. So anyway, that's for a future chapter, but that is, that yeah. is the heart of one of the future chapters that we're going oh, to really? come across. Before okay. much longer, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Yeah, I don't, I don't. So I don't mean. Go ahead. You no, I'm just well. Uh, just to continue, Scott, on that point that you've raised several times, I think it's essential. I think it's logical that an Epicurean has to be willing to be active when action is required. Otherwise, yes. you lose your life, you lose your happiness, you lose everything. You you cannot just simply take a stoic position of my mind is sufficient to protect me from anything that challenges me and, and I'm not going to be perturbed no matter what happens. One of the statements in Dogenes Laertius, Scott, is that the wise man is going to feel emotion more deeply than mm -hmm. the unwise. Yeah, so if you I feel that emotion to... deeply, you're going to act on it. Yeah, I don't mean to suggest that the Epicurea, Epic, Epicurus that I described at first, where he is sweet, he's kind, he's able to withstand criticism without getting angry. So I don't mean to suggest that he is therefore weak and then he has to go contrary to that and be strong. I think that that candor and kindness can be right in hand in hand with being strong. So well, what Scott, I think- you, you may not ahead. be suggesting it, but it is suggested all over the place <laughs> out on the internet and in the commentators. <laughs> That that, yeah. that is the classic criticism, I guess, even going back to Cicero, that, that mm -hmm. if you're an Epicurean, you're just basically useless when hard times come and you're, at, yeah. and you're asked to do something to save your family or save yourself or save the country. You're going to be yes. useless if you're an Epicurean. I, I agree. And, and I agree. We have, I to, we, have to, 
reject that uh, contention. You're one hundred percent right because it's actually weakness. If if you insult me right now, Cassius, and my anger gets the better of me, and I say, "Well, you're a jerk back to you," I have demonstrated my weakness. I'm sorry, I have not demonstrated strength. The stoicism that we talk about, the heroic stuff of you know keeping your emotions under control and stuff that is a false sense of strength it's not true strength it's where i'm protecting myself with my honor and dignity and so forth so i i don't have any problem with it but in this paragraph here i didn't but, see that i saw something different but anyway go ahead right 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 on, on the other hand scott if you point a gun at me and mm -hmm. i do nothing other than stand with my arms clasped and say you can just go ahead and shoot me because it's not mm -hmm. going to hurt me that's not strength that's no. foolishness to some absolutely people. so you have to absolutely. you have to take you, action when appropriate sure and it might be that a stoic would stand there with his arms crossed and say kill me i don't care but a, a right. epicurean should not because they're honest as hell enough about life that they ought to say okay it is time to take action right now i don't have to hate this guy He's probably a mangled person in some way, but I need right. to take action so that I try to stop him from killing me and hopefully from hurting himself too. Right. That would right. be strength because I've still managed to keep my mind in going about use some wisdom with myself, not just reacting with my childish kind of reactions. So I see that as strength when you can, whether you have to try to take a gun away from someone to do something active, or you have to actually actively insult somebody. I'm going on too too far about this. You get point. Sorry. No, this is <laughs> sometimes this is I a, just get going. This a, <laughs> no, this is a great point. A great, a probably a good point to come almost to a conclusion on. We're just about at the uh, one hour point, but we not, don't have to finish yet. So Scott, I mean Joshua, what uh, other points for this evening? Well, there are a couple of mentions to cynicism once again. I don't know if we want to bring that up. This little sort of micro story about uh, Diogenes and Plato, in which uh, Diogenes, thus do I tread on the pride of Plato, said Diogenes, setting his foot on the robe of the academic. Yes, with the greater pride of Diogenes, returned Plato. Um, so, and then there's that line in the a little bit later, I think, where he says that. Uh, Stoics and Cynics, and most of his critics uh, fall under one of those two headings. Yes, I remember that from listening to it today as well. That was an interesting, it was interesting to me to think about whether he was trying to limit the number or, or sort of categorize his enemies as particular types or not. And I wasn't sure exactly what that meant. Because it's consistently the case in this book that Plato doesn't really come in come in for it a whole lot mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. this is typically written against the stoics and the cynics the, Sto mm -hmm. the stoics in particular yeah but we i think we tend to have a view that it was more plato that epicurus was responding to when he sort of crafted his his philosophy yeah and it's almost as if francis right here has taken the more conventional i mean everybody seems like who knows a little bit about epicurus kind of pits those two against each other the stoics versus the epicureans i guess they do sort of stand out as art typical opposites uh, and, but you're right she doesn't really talk much about plato or now she does specifically criticize uh, aristotle uh, as in one of these later chapters but I'm trying to think if there is a specific criticism of Plato. I'm not sure I can recall. But she does have Leontium specifically say something Aristotle as we go towards the end. Please tell me if I'm wrong. I, I see. I thought Epicurus, Epicurus was developing his philosophy with the, the biggest um, argument against the cynics who were immediately previous to him. And it was later on where the Stoics uh, were taking it on with Epicureanism, but that was after Epicurus was basically gone. This was they were taking it up with the philosophy, not so much with Epicurus. Is that true, Scott? Uh, it depends on who you listen to. Um, the <laughs> oh. <laughs> the the Dewitt book that I cite constantly makes the argument that Epicurus is predominantly aligned against Plato, and that mm. the Stoics, as you said, they sort of came along later. And mm -hmm. Epicurus was not reacting to the Stoics because the Stoics had not even really been invented by the time he started uh, talking. Mm -hmm. But when you say against the cynics, DeWitt makes the argument, which I find persuasive, that, and this is what uh, Joshua and I were talking a little bit about this uh, before the, we started this episode, but it does seem that another one of your key issues, this issue of skepticism, was a major issue for Epicurus. And that a lot of the atomism, if you follow the DeWitt theory, or, or I think most commentators would say this, is that Epicurus's atomism was a, 
attempt to make the world understandable so as to be able to arrive at some conclusions of some mm-hmm. degree of confidence. And DeWitt specifically says that he considered not only Pyrrho and the skeptics to be wrong, but that he considered Plato to be a, a skeptic and even Aristotle to some extent. In fact, you've got very good documentation of the point in uh, Diogenes of Oinoander. There's a line that says that Aristotle and his peripatetics argue that the flux is so fast that it's impossible to know anything with certainty. And that Epicurus responded that, yes, we agree that there is a flux, but not that it is so fast that we can't make something out of it. So you've got at least that argument. And I think many other texts can be used to line up the same thing, which is what DeWitt does to argue that really Epicurus was an anti-Platonist mm-hmm. more so than he was uh, an anti. Now, when you say cynic, I'm not sure I would have necessarily. Why did you? Why did you think of the cynics as a in distinction to? Well, I mean, this what is are, what was brought up right here was the the cynics and the Stoics, and I really overstated my case because I, I shouldn't really have said that he was taking issue with and fighting the cynics, but actually mm-hmm. he was differentiating himself from them because he took a lot from them and from that tradition and so forth. He wasn't a radical cynic like whatever that first guy was, Aristophanes or whatever, um, but mm-hmm. he wasn't like that. But he wanted to, he saw the problems that the cynics had and the skeptics had when they were when they went to the forum, because they were getting, they were getting some problems with their philosophers. They had some uh, inconsistencies and so forth that I think Epicurus was trying to correct. And, and he really formulated a better a response that stood the test of, you know, arguing against these other philosophies like, you know, Aristotle and Plato and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think what we're finding in, in Francis Wright's book here that she is really focusing on this classic difference between Epicurus and the Stoics or the Cynics mm, and the different, yeah. different, the different people that she's listed so far here, which is kind of a conventional approach to it. The DeWitt approach is that you need to go even beyond that to understand exactly where Epicurus was coming from, because it's, mm. it's more um, that he was strictly in matters of time. He came before the Stoic, like you said, and mm. he was really right after Aristotle and Plato as well. So he was, he would have been dealing more with uh, the, the mainstream schools. Joshua, what mm-hmm. are you thinking in response to this? Well, there's another point that uh, DeWitt in particular makes, and it's in response to this challenge that's often made to Epicurean philosophy, that Epicurus was uh, kind of just a boob. You know, he wasn't uh, he wasn't a man of culture or learning. He didn't appreciate uh, the finer arts or, or literature or the mathematics or geometry, um, which in their view made it impossible for him to really appreciate uh, philosophy as they understood it. But DeWitt argues that, in fact, Epicurus, more than any other thinker from uh, the Greek world, he really made an effort, again, more than any other, to really survey the whole field. He, he wanted to know not just what his opponents were thinking in this school, but he wanted to know what every school thought about this given subject. And so what you're going to find, I think, is that while it's true that a large portion of his antagonism is for Plato, you are also going to find uh, criticism from Epicurus and Epicureans of Aristotle and uh, the Peripatetics, of uh, the Cynics, of the Stoics, of the uh, Cyrenaics. So it's really every school of philosophy in the ancient world that Epicurus had uh, strong opinions about. Yeah. And Scott, you're an interesting example. And I'm so appreciative of your participating in this because your questions and so forth. A Few Days in Athens is more of a generalist book, I think, about Epicurus. And it doesn't probably drill down on some of the details that you in particular would be interested in as to skepticism and so forth. She really sticks with the more ethical side of things. And although there's a lot of interesting material in here, and I think it's it really lends itself to a, a book club type discussion. It's not as deep on certain angles as, as somebody like you who are interested in particular parts of philosophy would probably. It, it, it serves our purpose well for the book club. It's not going to unfortunately address some of the depth of your questions. Nevertheless, Scott, I'm I'm continually glad that you that you raised them. Uh, because, <laughs> well, because Absol- otherwise... <laughs> absolutely, that's exactly right. Because otherwise, exactly it's right. just me and Cash just listening to each other <laughs> repeat the same stuff back and forth. <laughs> 
So it couldn't be more valuable. Yeah, exactly well, it's good right. to throw a little bit of idiocy into the mix because then, yeah, you have to answer to it. <laughs> well, well, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't call it that, but <laughs> no, no, I really do think that this hopefully will help some people in the future to be a prototype for other local meetings that they can listen to some of this background and your commentary, Scott, and your questions are far more intelligent than most of the questions that you probably get at your average coffee house. Probably. <laughs> so, okay. Well, anything else for tonight? I think we hit chapter eight pretty well, and, and we'll go into some more general discussion with Leonti next week, probably the time limit for tonight. Any final thoughts from anybody? Uh, not from me. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, very good. We'll come back next uh, Sunday night and do the next chapter then. So thanks a lot. All right. Thank you all. All right. Good night. Good night.